Well, good morning, gang. I'm off early. It's 9 o'clock, and I'm already headed off to start the Runyon Canyon hike again. Then I have to go get my hair cut, do some vlogging, have some fun. It's going to be a full day. I'm about to start where the stairs start, so I'll check back in with you guys when we get to the top. Well, we're pretty close. Remember this? I'm doing better today than I did yesterday, which is good. No stops yet, other than to film that. Yesterday, I had to make five stops on the way up. Today, so far one, and I'm almost to the top. Right up there. Here we are. Good job, guys. So today I actually timed it. And from where I parked my car, exactly to the seat was 30 minutes exactly. So I was telling you guys yesterday, there's like three different trails that you can take over here. And in a way, I would kind of consider this the medium one. That one over there being the hard one. But uh, when I used to do this and I lost all that weight, I would occasionally run into some stand-up comedians that I knew. And they would be out here hiking together, like four of them. And uh, I remember one day running into one of those guys at the comedy store. And he made a really funny point about hiking out here. He said, well, you know how you pick which trail to do? You just look at the bodies on everybody doing the trail. He goes stairs everybody's in pretty good shape he goes when you do the uh, the higher one even better shape and I was like that's a good point all right we're done so today as I'm leaving my hike right at the foot of Runyon Canyon right over there I have some people giving away free iced coffee supposedly the best coffee in Italy Lavanza. It just seems to find me everywhere I go. Well, right here at the base of Universal Studios in Universal City, we're going to check out something that, well, I guess indirectly, is kind of related to Universal, even though it's not. Because what I wanted to show you guys today was, uh, you know, I know the world now is consumed by Disney, and there's so many people out there that just love everything about Disney, they love the characters of Disney, but I just didn't grow up with that. I never really had that attachment to Disney. Um, I do really appreciate Walt Disney. Um, not that he was perfect, obviously. He has, there's some dark rumors and dark history there, but as far as what he accomplished and as many failures as he lived through and was able to make a success, I find that admirable. But I never really had an attachment to Disney because, baby, I was a Hanna-Barbera kid. And this right here in front of us was the old Hanna-Barbera Studios. And uh, all the way down to, let's get around this, the original guard shack, what they called the Jetsons-like guard shack, right here at 3400 Kawanga. And, Hanna-Barbera was something else, man. Basically, like, the reason that Hanna-Barbera plays such a strong role in my life is that because when all of you, uh, or most of you, grew up going to Disney theme parks, going to Universal Studios, I was going to Kings Island, and Kings Island in Cincinnati, Ohio, their theme for their children's land was Hanna-Barbera land. So 
So everything there were the magical characters of Hanna-Barbera. Their studios went from all the way down here, this kind of Capitol Records looking building right down here that they've restructured over the years and went from there all the way to the end of there. And Hanna-Barbera has a pretty fascinating story. They were actually the original lead animators for MGM from 1939 until 1956 to 57. There's a little bit of dispute what exact, when exactly their tenure there ended, but they were responsible, if you can believe it, for Tom and Jerry. They had a couple of incarnations with different names, but it was always the cat and mouse that kind of set them apart. And, um, Basically what happened was MGM at one point decided in 1957 that it just wasn't profitable to make cartoons. The animation department just wasn't there. And so Joseph Hanna and William Barbera had talked to one of their bosses shooting at ideas at him at MGM before he had actually, uh, before they had both been laid off, fired. And this guy actually liked their ideas enough to where he helped them secure a, uh, a distribution deal that gave their distributor 20%, but it allowed these guys to basically take over the entire Saturday morning cartoon world. And how they did that, which is pretty fascinating to me, was that, see, when they worked for MGM, they knew that it costed like $40,000, roughly, 40 to 60,000 just to make an animated picture. And Disney was going through this too, to where Disney was getting to the point where they just kind of thought it wasn't worth it to make five minute cartoons like that. So what Hanna-Barbera did was they realized that if they could hire all the people from MGM that they had worked with that had been fired for like a fraction of the price as a startup, they could actually invest less into the actual cost of each short, each cartoon. And so what they would do is they did a 10th of the animation slides. They kept it very simple and they focused mainly on making sure that each cartoon had a great story and they had a really great voice actors. And Hannah Barbera became a staple. You would know their cartoons completely based off of the type of voices that they had. And one of the cool things about Hanna Barbera was that when they uh, first started doing cartoons, they were the first animation studio to actually have um, an animated project in prime time, which was eventually the Flintstones, and it ran there for six years, and that was the longest running um, animated show in prime time until, of course, The Simpsons came along and just completely wiped that record out. But they also were the very first show, even beyond animated, they were the very first show to have a story arc where Wilma Flintstone was pregnant and you actually saw her being pregnant. And then they had Pebbles, which was originally supposed to be Fred Jr., but they realized through, um, through doing some market research that their products would sell better if it was a girl. And so this whole world of Hanna-Barbera took off. They were the first show, animated show, nominated and winning an Emmy for, you guessed it, the Flintstones. And what's interesting is anybody that's ever seen the Flintstones knows that the Flintstones was literally just the Stone Age honeymooners. And Jackie Gleason over the years would actually get kind of angry about this and threaten to sue them until one of his friends said, you know, uh, Jackie, I don't know if it's great to go down in history as the guy who killed Fred Flintstone. But over the years, um, Hanna-Barbera would just, they would keep creating these memorable characters to the point where they were had so many characters you couldn't even possibly name them. They would have all-star shows and you'd have so many characters in there they couldn't even fit on the screen. But Hanna-Barbera was known for Huckleberry Hound, McGilla Gorilla, Wally Gator, Pig, uh, Pixie, Dixie, and Jinx, um, Snagglepuss, Snidely, 
Blue Falcon, Space Ghost, Scooby-Doo. I mean, you name it, they probably had a hand in it. And like I said, it's just, it's one of those things. They had been doing this, they were the leaders of Saturday morning cartoons. I grew up watching USA Morning Cartoons and it was just, that was a staple in my life, was watching everything that they had put out. And to this day, it's still my favorite type of animation. The Hair Bear Bunch still cracks me up. Jabber Jaws was a complete, uh, send up or, or rip off of Curly from the Three Stooges. I mean, um, even Yogi Bear was beyond the name and they did get sued for that by Yogi Berra um, and they, they actually won. Yogi Berra did not win. But they based that whole Yogi Bear character off of um, Ed Norton all the way down to the hat. And they said that the whole reason that they ended up giving him his own show is because he made a guest appearance on Huckleberry Hound early on and people liked him more than Huckleberry Hound. So over the years, they would keep, just keep creating these shows to um, appeal to the ever-growing and changing world, like the Jetsons. And there's that guard shack I was telling you guys about, that Jetson-style guard shack. But if you look at the Jetsons, so many things that they used in the Jetsons are starting to come true now. Like when they would talk to each other over a screen, that's FaceTime, baby. I mean, they, they really were ahead of the time. And what's crazy about a lot of their shows, and I don't know why they never figured this out, but they would have a hit show, something like The Jetsons or Johnny Quest, they would make an initial run of like 24 episodes, and then no matter how successful it was, they didn't make any more episodes for like literally 20 years. It took them 20 years to decide, oh yeah, maybe we should make, maybe The Jetsons should have more than 24 episodes, and then eventually it would just turn into franchise after franchise of movies. I mean, I can't even count how many different incarnations in TV shows there were, the Flintstones, the Flintstone Kids, the Flintstone Friends, Yogi Bear and Friends, uh, the Yogi Bear movies, the Jetsons movies, the Jetsons meet the Flintstones, I mean, it just was never ending. But I loved it, and it's too bad in the mid-90s that this all shut down. And there are a lot of people like me because apparently in early 2000s, um, I believe it was like either the five or ten year anniversary, a bunch of fans um, staged a big celebration right out here out front. And if you can believe it, right there where that 3400 sign is now, used to be a, um, pictures of like Megillah Gorilla. Some of the most memorable cast of any of the Hanna-Barbera shows. So I'll of course put in um, a handful of pictures of the different cartoon characters that Hanna-Barbera were responsible for creating and the amazing cartoon history that I feel like is somehow forgotten. But uh, for me, it will always come down to Hanna-Barbera, Hanna-Barbera Land. It's one of the greatest memories of my life was um, riding a carousel at Kings Island as a kid and getting to sit in Jabberjaw's mouth. So when I found out that it was right over here on Coanga, and it's now, I believe, a different kind of business, and even at one point it was residential apartments, if you can believe that, I just had to come over here and take you guys down memory lane with me to revisit the greatness that was Hanna-Barbera. And now I believe they're engulfed by NBC or Universal, I think they, they run it now, but it will just never be what it once was. Check out this cool car. I'm near a beauty salon and she's totally pimped it out, almost like Charlie's Angels. Pretty cool. I just saw that and had to show you guys. All right, time for a haircut. All right, the haircut's done. I think it looks pretty good. Didn't take too long, nice and clean. That's all I need. Well, I went and picked Jaw up, so we're out taking a walk, and you know what else I I think I have to give Hanna-Barbera a lot of credit for as well? The other thing that they just knocked it out of the park with as a uh, cartoon was that they were experts at coming up with 
like the perfect catchphrases. They came up with like so many good ones, like Heavens to Murgatroyd and Yabba Dabba Doo and Zoinks and Captain Caveman. What else were the others? I hate Mises to Pieces. Um, God, man, they were just they were the kings of that. They always had a great like a great catchphrase for their characters. I think that that's lacking this day and age. Out taking a stroll. Good grief. Looks like the bananas have taken over the entire Hollywood and Vine corner. I really don't like bananas. Never have. A little bit about me. 